Good morning, everybody. I'm Alex Hayes from Orion and Taurus, and this is your monthly tip. I had the, the community posted a question via a private chat about what is the future or what's my take on the future of cryptocurrencies in general, but maybe more specifically Bitcoin and how it's going to, uh, to relate to central bank digital currencies as we see most of the major government authorities are now moving in this direction. So I did a little digging and some research because essentially what a cryptocurrency is, even Bitcoin, is a private currency. So it's not a public issued promissory note from a government authority that is saying that, that this is legal ten tender within its jurisdictions. What this is, is a private currency. And so I did a little history. I wanted to know, okay, I'm, what is the history of private currency in the United States? Let's localize in the United States. So what I found was the currencies or private currencies abounded greatly early in our history. So bigger companies would issue promissory notes or would issue things, uh, a piece of paper called or tokens called script or script. And this token was good at the local general store or it was good at, uh, you know, the local communities. It was very much a effort, an effort by bigger private institutions, whether it was a bank or was uh, a company like a coal mining company, wood, you know, woodcutters, you know, loggers, you know, whatever the industry was. Uh, typically in the United States, early in our history, we didn't have uh, connectivity. We didn't have, uh, you know, we didn't have a lot of institutions, especially the banking institutions on the fringe or frontier uh, fronts. So what what they what these companies did is they would issue their own tokens, which were good in small micro economies, the local economies, and in different places. And, and then the government said, okay, we're going, to, uh, we're going to start issuing our own currency. But they remembered, like during the Revolutionary War, they, they already tried this fiat currency experiment during the revolution and with uh, inter, uh, the continental dollar. So the continental dollar uh, basically was de depreciated it so fast it, it, it uh, the saying in the, the old saying in the United States it wasn't even worth a continent continental uh, was not a good saying but people lost faith in it because basically it was it was a scam or, or it was a fiat scheme to finance the war effort you know they pay the soldiers they had to pay everybody they had to pay for supplies and so they tried to garner support for a continental dollar and that didn't that didn't take uh, and that's why it disappeared because nobody nobody had any faith in it because of how much they printed of it and the circulation and it was all based on hopes and promises and basically on nothing kind of like what we have today but uh, but eventually as the country grew right the micro economies uh, needed some legal tender or needed some way of medium of exchange so they didn't have to barter for goods. They could take a token to the general store and say, hey, I want to buy XYZ. I need this amount of furs. I need some flour. I need some weed. I need some whatever it was, you know, boots, clothes. They could take those tokens, which were good money uh, because they were issued by the local employer, right? So, all of that and then the government said okay we're going to issue larger bills and the larger bills so nothing nothing less than five dollar bill now early on in our history you can appreciate that a five dollar bill is a lot of money they didn't have any small denominations right they so they over the history uh you know the 200 year history we kind of it was back and forth you know they they had larger bill denominations only and then the private industry stepped in and said, okay, we're gonna have our tokens are gonna be used for the smaller denominations, for the regular goods and services that people are gonna be using on a regular basis. We're gonna be able to have those smaller denominations. And you know, at some points the governments flowed in and out of the small denominations with 
you know, the coins and, and of their own, but essentially they, they ascribe to the Adam Smith model, the Wealth of Nations, that the smaller currency units tended to bring in higher inflation because they were not controlled as much because banks or governments typically didn't associate them or didn't assume that they would be cashed in for whatever was backing them, whether, you know, goods or services or gold. Uh, or silver, right? So they didn't. So they. So Adam Smith believed that the small denominations encouraged inflation because of the small denominations. They didn't think that they were going to be cashed in. They wanted those to be used as currency units. So a lot more currency units would be floated in circulation than uh, than needed to be. So suffice to say, or so, trying to summarize all of the the uh, a very long period period of our history about money private money has existed and it has its benefits and it has its drawbacks the one of the drawbacks of private money the biggest drawback is liquidity right so what is liquidity liquidity is 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 the issue of acceptance how liquid is your asset can you go anywhere can you, you know, can you go anywhere and spend your bitcoin right anywhere can you go to the grocery store can you go to the gas station can you go to all the places that you go to on a regular basis can you rely on that bitcoin to be able to give you dollars so that's the that's the question because just like the private currency in early history early american history uh, the the local script or tokens were not accepted widely. They were only good as legal tender, basically legal tender, in those micro economies. And I would, I would say to, 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 uh, to everybody that Bitcoin kind of is a micro economy at this point. You can't go anywhere in the world or you can't go anywhere down the street and, and even down the street and use your Bitcoin to go buy most goods and services that you need on a regular basis. What do you need? You need a credit card, or you need a debit card, or you need cash. You know, the U.S. dollar here in the United. I'm speaking United States. So that is a big problem, right? And I know that there's, you know, the people would say that there's the Lightning Network and all this other stuff, and I get that. But the issue is, it's not there yet, right? We haven't we haven't come to full uh, realization of using Bitcoin as a currency unit. Can it be used as a currency unit? I think it satisfies some of the basic principles of it, but it hasn't made it to that level yet. And it's gonna be interesting to see if we can get it to that level in the face of what uh, the CBDC's challenge is, right? So, so this is where you know that is that's a huge challenge that Bitcoin or, or crypto in general will have to overcome if it wants to be used as a currency, a real currency unit. The some pro, uh, some pros for it that I think uh, for private money again, and, and I think we've heard these from for, before. Uh, basically, it's hard money, right? So Bitcoin would be accepted as maybe hard money where. Governments didn't have the ability to just finance their their wars, their welfare states, like all this stuff. All the you know sound money principles would have to apply because they didn't have control of the printing press, right? So I think that is the issue that everybody kind of, and especially in the libertarian camp, this is what we want to see is more accountability, and you take basically taking the controls away from the government. Uh, to be able just to, to print an unlimited supply of, or finance an unlimited supply of resources so that it's and on the backs of taxpayers and uh, the citizens that have and that rely on that currency unit as a store of value. So I think that that is uh, that can be a plus. The, the negative with that is the flip side of this argument would also be though that the government, the United States government, would be hamstrung in order to protect itself in case of a national crisis, right? So let's say for whatever reason, some nationality or some nation state decided to try to 
uh, assert itself in dominance and really went after us. And we found ourselves in another world conflict in which the United States was defending herself. We would be hamstrung to do so because we couldn't pay for a lot of services. We couldn't pay for a lot of the materials. We couldn't pay for the army, or the navy, or all the recent air force or you know space force. Now we like we could not. The the game of fiat of financing debt is the strategy that has been you know been employed for a long, long time, way before the United States was even a nation. Um, so it does impact the ability of a nation to be able to defend itself. It could. I present that as an argument as it could, because I think it will, being that you can only pay for value in which you have. Now, it does bring about that you would have to have solid uh, principles of uh, maintaining your value and your, and your dollars, right? The governments would also would all of a sudden have to be solvent, meaning they'd have to run it more like a business operation. So the there is there's a lot of benefits and then there's some things to consider that may not be so pleasant but each of them have trade-offs so another another potential uh issue that i have personally with trusting in private currency or private privatizing money is that all of a sudden we have given control of the resource of our store value of our currency unit some I'm in, we're tr putting a lot of faith and trust into us into a handful of people in which we do not have any voice we have no sway we have no voice we have no input we have no representation it is very very dangerous in my opinion to be to put that much control and faith into a small group of people in which you have no idea and uh, who they are or what their agenda is and unfortunately uh this is the issue right Th this to me is probably the biggest issue that you don't get something for nothing money or dollars or currency or you know gold or you know whatever value you know, medium of exchange value you want to put on it. All of these things are inanimate objects. They are amoral. They do not have an agenda. They, they just simply exist. What makes something good or evil is the person behind it. How they, how they are employed, right? A lot of dollars in a bank account can do a lot of good and good charity organizations or through the, 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 the church or through uh, ministries. Like there are tons of good things that can be used with money, with dollars, spending dollars. The flip side of that is also true. Lots of dollars are spent on evil things. Like drug cartels, mafias, you've got, you, you, I mean, you, you have all kinds of evil and heinous acts that are committed via the exchange of a currency, right? But the currency itself is not the problem. It's not, it's not money and it's not currency that's the issue. It's the person behind it who controls it, who wields that power. And when we have a private currency unit, even Bitcoin, there's, this is software. This is not, this is not, uh, this is not anything that is completely this is not the law of gravity right this is not physics bitcoin is not physics bitcoin is a software program protocol that is managed by a handful of developers all the way at the top some of which we have no idea who they are but some re a little bit of research and you can actually find who they are because things like segwit or software patches or updates they happen that happen all the time code software code is not law that is i think a, a setting setting bitcoin up as a messiah savior and it is very very dangerous and you're you're going to be set yourself up for a lot of disappointment right i think it's a great advancement it's an amazing tool um it, it, there's so many use cases and business cases that we haven't even explored yet the in business in, in to use the bitcoin protocol but it is not law bitcoin is not law changes were uh, our changes to the code are possible because it's a software right 
Now, not everybody can do it, yes. So that means there's some protection. But there are people at the top of the, of the chain that govern the protocol, whether it's BTC, BSV, BCH, like the, 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 change that run, the chains that run on the Bitcoin protocol. There's a governing body of, enti- of people that can control it, right? So l- I think that that to me is probably the most dangerous thing about a private currency is not knowing who those people are and, and not knowing what they're capable of. How will they wield it? There's no accountability there. You know, there, there's, you can, all it takes is uh, a few people to come together and say, okay, we can try to tilt the balance in our favor. And all of a sudden now we've got a, back to the old system of there's exclusion of people. There's, there's, you know, now there's no longer 21 million Bitcoin in circulation. Like all of a sudden there's a whole lot of different um, issues that's going to come up with not having Uh, not having representation, not having accountability in a system that we're relying on as a store value and a currency unit in the marketplace. So can be dangerous. Now let's talk about CBDCs. CBDCs are just as dangerous, right? All, All this stuff, again, a CBDC, I think, is a tool, right? And it can be wielded if it's wielded responsibly and with accountability, with, you know, with, there can be a good imp- implementation. But the issue is, is that a CBDC is designed for trackability and traceability and convenience, right? Speed, convenience, and, uh, and traceability. This is all what is the CBDC narrative right now, right? How do we digitize the economy? Well, if you've watched any YouTube videos from guys like George Gammon, you already realize, you already know that most of the economy is already mostly digitized. The, the, I think there's only like 3% paper currency units in, in circulation and 90, 97% of it is all digitized anyways on balance sheet ledgers from banking institutions. So by large, we are already a digital economy. But a CBDC implementation is, is basically designed to promote traceability, transparency in how businesses and people spend their money, right? Where's the value going? It's giving government another layer of control over the levers of the economy. It's, it's, it's the ability to program money. So yes, this is very concerning. It's very concerning when, when this much power is being placed in the hands of a handful of people. Um, but can it be used for good? Absolutely, it can be used for good. So, you know, there, there's the, the case that, you know, hey, if our government is looking out for a best interest and that everybody is using the same currency unit, well, now we're going to know what, you know, if, uh, if somebody is planning a malicious attack, right? We can go in, we could see what people are buying. Uh, buying patterns definitely relate to intent of, of how they're going about their day. And if somebody is acting unusual or somebody's buying things that uh, can create weapons of mass destruction, you're going to know about it. Now, on the flip side, yeah, the, it also can be used to track reasonable people. And if all of a sudden a political uh, opposition rises up and they say, okay, now you the danger is, is if you get labeled an enemy of the state for speaking your narrative, speaking your mind, right? Voicing your respectful opinion. If you become an enemy of the state because you differ in opinion than, than the mainstream or the majority of the, of the country, as they would like to say, all of a sudden you get marginalized and extra, you, know, the, you get uh, excommunicated from, from the system. That's the, that's the biggest danger, and that's, in, that's purely evil. When, when, you, when that level of uh, <laughs> abuse of power comes into play. So, yes. Is it dangerous? Yes. But, I mean, at the same time, fire is dangerous. But fire can be used to keep you alive, or fire can be used to, uh, as an implement 
of great evil and torture. So it's CBDC itself and data in and of itself is not inherently evil or good. It's the person or the group of people behind it that choose to interpret the data and act on the data in a way that suits their interest that makes it either good or bad, right? So with great power comes great responsibility as the great, <laughs> as the great philosopher Ben Parker from Spider-Man once said, great power means great responsibility. And if our citizens, as, and as citizens, if this is truly is the direction in which everything is now moving, which it appears to be so, this is the time now for us as citizens of our nations to really step up and start voicing our concerns and our opinions and making sure that those opinions are spoken to our local governments. You know, local governments and then state government elected officials and uh, our representation in Congress, the senators and the congressmen, like these are the these people should be a representation of us, and they should speak for us. We elect these people to speak for us, and they should know how concerned we are about these issues. And then they also should know that we care, and there needs to be accountability. And we, the people of the nation, need to hold the government accountable to do what we say that we need them to do right so this is this is our time to really take step up and take responsibility to be leaders to uh, to to be leaders and not parasites on our nation we need to step up and take responsibility for our, our actions but also the actions of our government so uh, can bitcoin exist in the face of cbdc's absolutely uh, the future is unknowable, right? It's both certain and unknowable at the same time. It's, it's the, the, the Schrodinger's box, right? Schrodinger's cat a theory. It's, it's, it's both at the same time until you open the box, right? But we won't know uh, exactly how things will play out. So, but I am, I am very excited about how Bitcoin can have use cases that are outside of uh, what everybody else is talking about right now. I think, I think that any kind of crypto currency um, for the survival of that protocol or that program will rely solely on the utility it provides to the people of the people of a nation and the world in general. But without utility, especially in the current economic times and moving into, you know, now definitely moving into recession, possibly depression territory, like for not just the United States, but global economy slowdown, uh, like utility will be the word to be really go after. And if you don't provide utility, if your, if your currency or your program does not provide utility for people and bring value to people, then it's just not going to, it's not going to make it because people will not suffer things that provide them no value. So if the protocol can provide value, it will survive. And I absolutely believe that. And I think that Bitcoin has a lot more to offer than people are talking about right now. And that's what I'm really excited about. That's why I'm still here. That's why Orion and Taurus still exists as a Bitcoin infrastructure service company is so that we can be here to provide the service that is needed to continue to build out and, and really flesh out this idea of what Bitcoin is capable of. So we're very excited about the future of Bitcoin, and, and, uh, but, we're, but we're also cautious about what else is coming on the horizon. So um, be smart, educate yourself, you know, make sure that you are paying attention to what governments are doing, especially your government, if you, whatever state you live in, but on the federal level, make sure we're paying attention and make sure that our representation know our voice because we have words are the most powerful weapon on the planet right with words we can lift up and build and create amazing things and we can also use words to destroy and utterly obliterate people so make sure we use them well use your words well all right so with that 
I think I've spoken enough. I hope you got value out of this very long-winded uh, monologue, but uh, these are some of my opinions. These are all my opinions. I put this forward to you as uh, for entertainment uh, consumption, and, and hopefully you got some value out of it. But, uh, you know, we thank you that you're here, and uh, yeah, have a great one. Thanks.